79th interview of the Bronx African American History Project. It is November 20th, 2006, and we are interviewing Benji Melendez, a longtime Bronx activist, musician, and philosopher, uh, who um, is going to be talking about growing up in the Bronx and his experiences with gangs and with peacemaking and music and activism. Uh, our videographer, Dawn Russell, is also uh, attending, uh, and Maxine Nodell, principal of Millennium Arts Academy, and um, Johnny Mann and Andre, who are two students at the Stevenson High School Complex. So, uh, Mr. Melendez, uh, tell us a little bit about your family and their background. Uh, my family's background is it's, it's, it's unique and it's different. But it's refreshing to be from our community because when we were living there, we felt ourselves different from the people who live in the area. I knew why we felt different, because our rituals were different, the way we were talking was different, our way of thinking, our philosophy was way different. Um, my parents happened to be Maranos, which are uh, secret Jews. We were uh, crypto Christians. I mean, they're outside, very Christian, but at home, very Jewish. Now, we knew about this as we were little, and we were never supposed to talk about family secrets to no one. So everything that my parents would teach us, we were supposed to give that light to the people in our community. In other words, show the example. This is how you live. This is, uh, uh, you treat your neighbor good. You treat people kind. And when you do that, you get good rewards. My father always said, you treat people nice, you're going to get uh, rewarded for that. So uh, in our home, we uh, even in our foods, everything was different. When we had pateles, which is uh, uh, it's in the Puerto Rican cuisine, it's um, made out of uh, platanos, okay? But the Puerto Ricans, when they do it, they usually do it with pork. We did it with beef. We didn't cook with manteca, which is uh, lard, it was oil. So everything we did was kosher in our eyes. Even when, when, when we introduced uh, uh, some of my neighbors and I gave some pateles, they said, no, oh, we don't need that. So, and even we heard a comment from one of our friends who told this family, oh, that's so Jewish. I said, it's stupid. This is patele. And if anything, beef is good for you. You know, but they didn't want to understand that. So because of them, if patele is not patele, if it's made out of pork. All right, all right. So then, um, at home, cut, every Cut, cut, I'm sorry. Now, can I just fix this mic? Because it keeps disappearing under um, your cover. Oh, yeah? Oh. Okay. Now you, yeah, you got by means of Right. Okay. Um, when did your family come to the United States? Ah, uh, okay. That's a good question. I was born in August the third, nineteen fifty-two. I came here eight months. I came here eight months. I was born in Puerto Rico, came here eight months. So my father came earlier. My father came much earlier. He came a year, um, yeah, eight months earlier. So he was here early, uh, and, and he came to the United States earlier. I think it was 19, I can't. Uh, yeah. What sort of work did your father do? My father was a laundryman. He owned a laundry. Uh huh. You know, the cleaners. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, the the economic situation in Puerto Rico was not that well. Mm -hmm. So he moved over to, at that time, his sister moved to the United States already, two or three years ahead. Mm -hmm. I think that's what it was, yeah. So the following year, he went over there. Now, what neighborhood did they move to from ah, Puerto Rico? From there, from Puerto Rico, we moved to 23rd Street. No, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, no, 23rd Street and 10th Avenue. Chelsea. Yes, where the train is, the house is still there. Mm -hmm. The house is still there. Mm -hmm. We moved there. We stood there for a little while because my mother lived, and my grand, uh, my aunt lived, and my father's sister lived there. Mm -hmm. So we were there for a little while. Then from there, we moved to 125th Street and Broadway. Now, when I was a little boy and we lived there, my mother just gave birth 
to a little baby girl. Mm -hmm. She went downstairs for a few minutes just to pick up the mail. I was playing with matches. I was a little boy. I didn't know anything. Playing with matches. The place got on fire. The only thing I remember was the fireman taking my brothers and I outside. I looked at my mother. She was screaming. Found out later on that the little girl died in the fire. I was a baby. I didn't know anything. From there, my father packed us up, packed up, and we moved to 14th Street, where uh, Washington and Horatio, we lived there, Reddit's Village area. I loved that place. That was my world. And we used to go to Gainesport, um, the sanitation department. We used to go there. I remember when we were little, we used to get milk in front of the door. It contained uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, bottles of milk. Mm -hmm. Also, the streets didn't have the tar that you have today. They were cobblestones. So then my father would say, here, take these knives and go out there and tell the man to sharpen it. So the guy would come with a carriage. <laughs> so then we'd give them the blades and he'll sharpen it. <laughs> then the, uh, the man would come with ice. Go get me ice. So he goes out there, breaks the ice <laughs> in the machine, get a bucket now, of Now, were you living in like walk-up buildings? Were they like tenements? Yeah, they were old tenements, yeah. I oh, on the first floor. Right. 789 Washington Street Apartment 1R. Never forgot that. Uh-huh. Okay? So we lived there. And it was, the whole place was between, I'd say, Washington and Rachel. These were all families. Mm -hmm. Cousins, uncles. And so we had an uncle called Theo Tony. I forgot the name of his band. He had his Latin band on the third floor. And he used to play in those days. He used to play the flute. Mm -hmm. uh, my family's music inclined. Everybody is into music. If you don't know how to play guitar, it's piano. Not the piano, the flute. Everybody plays, mm -hmm. sings, writes music. Now, was in, when you were growing up, did people speak Spanish in the house? All the time. It's, it's interesting. I was saying this to, to my wife. When we were growing up in my, in, in, uh, where we lived at, they had, the women had painters. You know what paint is? You know the Spanish women with the lace? Mm. Well, everybody used to dress like that with the big bands. That's the way it was in my house. It was like Spain. So all the old ladies were we were just looking. Now, now, when did your family move from Spain to Puerto Rico? Was how long? How long? Now, ago? this is now. No, this that I remember. My father was born in 1899. My father said, "I remember when the Spaniards were still walking down the streets." I remember they didn't enter Puerto Rico until what 1898. Mm. They came into Puerto Rico 1898. He was growing up. So, um, in 1899, he said, well, he was growing up, he still remembered there were still Spaniards there. You no, know, the Americans already came in, but there were still Spaniards in the streets. Um, my grandparents came, my father's, which I did not know. And I said, Papi, was your father born in Puerto Rico? No. My father came from Spain with his parents. So, my great-grandparents came to Puerto Rico. Right. He said, what did Grandpa look like? So, one day... By accident, we were looking at Archie Bunker. He said, they got my father right there. Mm -hmm. He looked just like him, just like him. I said, oh, please. So he called my mother. He said, oh, Zephina, King, oh, yeah, your father looked just like him. Okay? So, um, oh, they came into Puerto Rico. That, I don't remember what year they came, but they were not born in Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. They came, they migrated from Spain to PR. Mm -hmm. And then the family moved from Puerto Rico to New York. To New York, yes. Uh -huh. Did you always live in neighborhoods with a lot of Puerto Ricans in, when you in Manhattan? No. When we lived in 125th Street and Broadway, mm -hmm. there were still Jews, Italians, Irish, mm -hmm. pockets of blacks here, mm -hmm. and the Puerto Ricans were on the bottom. My father, there was a restaurant called Luz, L-U-Z, mm -hmm. Luz, light, but it was a Sephardic restaurant. Mm. Spanish Jews. My, my father at that, so that was predominant. I remember seeing uh, uh, many Jews in that area. Now, where did your, where was your father's laundromat? What neighborhood was it in? In San Juan. And so he owned in San Juan, and then what, what did he do? When okay, he, now when he came over here, that's when he, uh, uh, he got a store, uh -huh. a store on Stevens Avenue. Uh -huh. I'm sorry, 163rd Street, between Prospect and Stevens Avenue, and then he had another store around the corner. And what kind? Of, what, what grocery store? So he had a grocery store right in Morrisania. Yeah. Two wow. grocery stores. Two grocery stores. And he was the uh, superintendent of four buildings. Wow. So he was a superintendent of four buildings yes. that owned two grocery yeah. stores. Yeah. And when did he get those stores in the Bronx? Well, that he already, remember, when we lived in Manhattan, he already had the stores up there in the Bronx. Okay. So he, uh, you were living in Manhattan and he had his, his yeah, property he in the Bronx. Yeah, he was already in the Bronx. But people already, 
many of the Puerto Ricans already migrating to, to the Bronx. Everybody was moving to the Bronx at the time. Uh -huh. What kind of music did you grow up with in your house? Aguinaldo and Argentine music. I never forgot that. No Tita Puente, no Celia Cruz. Mm -mm. My, in my father's house, there was old Spanish music. I never forgot that. The old, um, what's the name of the Argentine music? Um, that yeah. they do the certain dances? Tango? Tango? Uh huh, uh -huh. That, Tango? That type of music we always heard in the house. And old Spanish music. My father used to have those old, those uh, long records, long playing records. Never. Tito Puente, we heard Tito Puente when we moved to the Bronx. Mm -hmm. But not when we lived in Manhattan. Right. Now, how old were you when you moved to the Bronx? Right after Kennedy died, the following year. So, 1964. Yeah. So, most of your childhood, uh, you were born in 52. Yes. So, you were in junior high school when you moved to the Bronx? No, I was in PS41. I was still in uh, elementary school. Mm -hmm. I used to go PS41. Now, you go to PS41 today. You, you, you had no Puerto Ricans to that school. I told the teacher when I went back, I was with my wife. She looked at me and said, you still? Yes, I used to go to school. I was a little boy. What street was that on? St. Vincent Hospital. Mm -hmm. well, right down the block. Okay, so this is in Manhattan. You yes. were the old. Now, what was it like speaking Spanish at home and going to a school where nobody was Spanish speaking? Um, I didn't feel alienated mm -hmm. because there was a lot of Puerto Ricans who were going to the school, too, and all the... Other Hispanic, like the Spaniards, mm -hmm. but there was a Spanish, very big Spanish community there, few Mexicans, right? right. But in the house, uh, um, that's what it was spoken all the time, was Spanish, Spanish, Spanish. Mm -hmm. We learned English by watching the television and hanging out in the street right. with the guys. Now, did you know, you're you're growing up in the 50s. Did, did rock and roll make an impression on oh, you? Oh, yeah, it sure did. The Four Seasons, uh -huh. okay? Uh, the Four Seasons. Uh, oh, as a matter of fact, before that, um, the one who used to bring the grocery store, the, gross, the, uh, the grocery bags, to my mother's apartment and my father when we lived on 121st Street was the guy from, uh, what's his name? I know you. Anthony and Phil, him. Little, from Little Anthony. Yes, he, he used to bring it upstairs. And my, and, and my brothers and my sister say, Ben, you know that? He used to bring the groceries. They used to practice right there in, in, in the hallway uh -huh. where we used to live at. I didn't know that already in those days. Mm -hmm. So it would, uh, little Anthony and Phil was an impression on us. Uh, the doo wops, mm -hmm. and later on came the four seasons. Well, we flipped on the, on the mm -hmm. four seasons. I mean, then uh, um, the, the 50, that was Beach Boys. Mm -hmm. Oh, those, uh, to me, that was, uh, everything changed when the Beatles came. Mm -hmm. Beatles came into, uh, into the United States, was a completely different thing. Mm -hmm. I remember when my brother first introduced me to the Beatles, when we moved to the Bronx, he said, hey, baby, they have four faggots. They come in from mm -hmm. England, four faggots? Yeah, they got long hair. Now, when you look at the pic, when you look at them now, to me, that's not long hair, that long. You know what I mean? But we didn't know. My father said, "Listen, you want to sing their songs? I don't care. I don't want your hair. I don't want your hair like that." Yeah, so we didn't have our hair like that. But we, we first heard them. But we got our harmonies to the chipmunks. Remember Alvin and the chipmunks? Oh, how could I forget it? <laughs> we learned our harmonies by listening to them, uh -huh. and then everything, uh -huh. everything changed from there. Uh huh. So you, you and your brother sang harmony together? Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, what was the Bronx like when you got there? Oh, man, when we moved to the Bronx the first time, first of all, I asked, I said to my wife, I don't know how I got here. My brother said, man, we came by car. My other brother said, yeah, but we came by train. I said, man, how did we get here? I don't remember. All I know, when I left, I felt it was a, it was a different world, a different world. When I we came to the Bronx and we lived on Stevens Avenue, first of all, the, the house. Stebbins the, between where and where? Stebbins between 163rd uh -huh. and 165th Street. Okay, I know. Right it's near Thessalonia Baptist Church. Yes, yeah. With that big giant synagogue. Yeah, that yeah. was a synagogue. Right, right. right. Okay. Now, for the first time, for the first time, the, I went to PS23. Mm -hmm. PS23, that's in the... Now, the Bronx at that time, well, it was beautiful. A lot of nice, beautiful houses. Um... The streets were really clean. 23, that was right near where the forest houses are yes. now. Yes, yes. Right. It was nice around there. And, but I kept on, I was homesick. I said, man, I, I miss 14th Street. I miss uh, 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 Greenwich Village. And every every other week, where would we go? Mm -hmm. We always go to the same spot. I tell my children, since they were tiny, I said, I live here. I said, what do we move back here? Oh, are you crazy? 
you know, I even ask, I, I tell people when they, when they live in the apartments, I live, I say, excuse me, do you have elevators in those buildings? Yeah. We never had that. Our stairs were wooden. So then at the first time, I went to PS23 in the Bronx. So my first altercation, and my hair was combed back like this, the pompadour. I had a, an altercation with a young black girl. And she said, this white boy started that. I never forgot that. Mm -hmm. She said, that white boy started. Nobody ever said that to me. Mm -hmm. White boy? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like Spanish, Puerto Rican, but whatever. I, I looked at the teacher and said, and I looked at my brother. My oldest brother was there. You know, because my father couldn't make it. was sick. Now, if you look at my oldest brother, you would never think he's my brother. Blue eyes, strawberry, and red. So I said, so when he said that, she said that, and I looked at her, I said, I felt weird. I was in, I was in another world. And I remember, now, that's where I met many blacks when, it, when I came to the Bronx. But in the, where I lived in, it was hardly nobody. It was, it was mainly whites, uh, specifically Italians and Irish. Mm -hmm. We always fighting with them. Mm -hmm. Come to the Bronx, different world altogether. You know what I mean? So I know that's a man. But we still, the, the, the same principle still lies at that time. You had the, uh, the discipline. My father would take me to school. Never forgot. They told the teacher, he gets out of hand, you give it to him, and then you let me know, I'll give it to him. That's the way it was in my time. I yeah. said, you could disrespect the teacher. You could say that. When those days, you know, so you had to, you know, the father gets you home, does the same thing. But in those days, I've learned to respect the, the law. Respect. Uh, even when you say, are you? You know, because... I was brought up always to respect my elder, even when I was in the gangs. When I was in the gangs and I had this change here, my hair, I had this, and you know, on the blade, uh, 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 an, uh, an older man, excuse me, you gotta get up the stairs. Oh, okay, come on guys, let's go. No, thank you, you're supposed to be, now, shut up, I'll tell the guy, you know, and that could be your pots, man, I, I don't want no trouble. So then, so, uh, uh, and when we lived in the Bronx, the burning down of the Bronx did not exist at that time. It was. Beautiful. This was 1964. Yes, it was beautiful. I used to go to John Dwyer Junior High School. Mm -hmm. It was fantastic. What junior high? Where? where? Junior uh, John Dwyer Junior High School. What? Right there on Stebbins Avenue. On Stebbins. Oh, uh, same place. Between Thessalonica Baptist Church, right there. There was a junior high right there. Yes, mm -hmm. it was called John Dwyer Junior High School 133. Right. Mm -hmm. um, um, now, do, you know, were there still movie theaters in the neighborhood? Yes. Right on Prospect Avenue, you had the Berlin Theater, you have the RKO, mm -hmm. you have the Lois, and then you have Prospect right around the corner. I went to see A Hard Day's Night, 007, and Hercules and Chains for 35 cents. <laughs> for 35 cents. And then when Batman came out, remember ba the original Batman? When he came out, he went to Berlin Theater. Oh, we were excited. We went up there. That, it was a different world at that time. Oh, what we had what about live music in the area? Oh, were there yes, clubs? Of course. Of, what were the places that you were Tropicana. Aware? The Tropicana, where you had Tito Puente, where you have Celia Cruz, where you have people like at the um, uh, at, at, at Cato, all right, at the uh, Mongo Santa Maria. Then you have Kogi Gardens, and then you have the Embassy Ballroom. Mm -hmm. Then you have... Uh, uh, Did you go to Hunts Point Palace at all? Yeah, oh, of course, you know. But that was not, that was not my thing. I never got into that. Mm -hmm. My brothers and I never got into such that. Was, everything was rock and roll. Mm -hmm. We were influenced with rock and roll in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. We came up with that up here. Uh -huh. See, you know, so we, even when we were ghetto brothers, we brought all these instruments out in the street. I remember we were doing Beatles and Grand Funk Railroad and, Be and Beach Boys and all this with congas, timbales, with guitars. Well, Africa Bambada said, I remember when you guys used to be on the street. Mm -hmm. He said, before we started with all these big amplifiers, I remember you guys were doing that. We were doing that mm -hmm. already. What was the street life like on Stebbins Avenue? Um, you know, did people do a lot in the street? Of course, there was parties. There was, on every Friday or Saturday, there was always a party. There was a community party. They closed the streets, and everybody went out there to have a good time. You know, I get nostalgia. I look back. And I remember we had, man, I look at the areas and it's not what it used to be, even though it's coming up again. Yeah. It's coming up again. Mm -hmm. got, they have a, 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 um, a sticker. It's, I am proud to live in the New South Bronx. Mm -hmm. Now, you go back to the community where I used to live at, forget it. The rent's there. If you don't work, they don't accept welfare. 
The little work you can't live there. Then I go back and I said, man. In fact, I was in Blackie's house the other day. Blackie started the Savage Coast again. Yeah. So Blackie, Blackie lives nice. Oh, Blackie, man. You know, see, Benji, look. It's coming up again. It's not what it used to be. Look at that, man. It's how beautiful it is. Oh, it looks nice. Yeah, on Stebbins, there's a lot of new buildings. Yes, yes. Uh -huh. And then you have um, you have whites that are moving up into Charlotte. Mm -hmm. Charlotte and the new house I met a black Irish family. Yeah. You know? Oh, check this out, man. You know, this is coming up. It's nice. But to live in those areas, you, now it's... Man, I, I'm, I, I feel really bad, uh, Mark, because and uh, where I live at today, guys, it's like I'm... I never lived like this before. I've always lived in a nice apartment. Now I live, if you go to my apartment, it's like going back to the South Point and back in those days. Am I right? Paying all this rent. We told them, man, why don't you fix this place, man? These guys don't want to do nothing. Where am I going to go? Where am I going to go? I have to save money, save money, hopefully to move away, and then look at, to see where I can find a, a, a apartment, a suitable rent so we can move. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's not, but I have to live with, with, uh, uh, with what I have right now. But uh, uh, um, I don't know. Now, when did you first become aware of gangs in the Bronx? When I lived in the Bronx, every community, every interval, every block was in the day with gangs. Now, I didn't want to just join a club because I, I, I felt that I can do this on my own. I don't want to be under a, somebody else's leadership when I can do it myself. Now, my greatest inspiration was John Wayne. I said I wanted to be just like John Wayne. Look at the way he commands the Marines. You know, look at the way he lands the Iwo, Iwo Jima. I said, man, I looked at him. I want to be like that. Well, chronologically, I started with the Barbarians. Then from the Barbarians, I joined the Copan Cats. Now, where were the Barbarians located? Prospect Avenue. Prospect Avenue between where and between where? Between 163rd Street and Prospect between 163rd and 165th Street, right here. Right. And it was on the roof. Uh -huh. you know, so we wore masks, like wrestling masks. Now, was this a multi-ethnic gang? Uh, or oh, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Mostly Puerto Rican guys, yeah. Uh -huh. We had that. We had that little group there together. So then from there, I joined the Copan Cats, which was on Marvin Avenue and Tremont, right, Mama? Marvin and Tremont. So you that was when you moved up there? Did you, you move up? No, I was still, I was living in Tiffany. Mm -hmm. But I was going up there because I knew a lot of people up there. Right. So I start, I, well, I left the Barbarians, joined the Copan Cats with my friend Huey, left uh, 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 left the Copan Cats, started the Savage Skulls. But originally it was called Savage Skulls Nomads. Uh -huh. Now, was this, that was, when you, was, was this when you were in junior high or high school? I was in uh, junior high. So you were... The Barbarians, I was in elementary school. You, were still, you, you joined your first gang when you were in elementary school? Yes. Now, what did it... It mean to be in a gang in the barbarians at that point. Power, power, mm -hmm. power. You know, but like I said, it's not. I, it's my ex-wife always pointed out. She said something interesting. She one day she was being interviewed by somebody from the New York Times. He said, uh, "Listen, we want to interview him. Then tell us something about Benji. Now you don't want to know anything about Benji. Let me tell you something about this guy. Okay, he's not the way. The way you see him like that, he projects himself to be that. He's not. This guy's a pussy guy. This guy likes to help me around the house." This guy likes to wash dishes. This guy likes to... Man, he's a nice guy. I was. You saw me those days, guys. I mean, with the chain and then you see, I walked around with a blade like that. He on the side of cop to me for that. For the patchy. You know what I mean? But if I were to see you, I'd say, Hey, guys, how you doing? Listen, my name is so-and-so. Would you like to join my club? That's the way it used to be. You know, I gave, I projected myself to look mean, but it, that wasn't really me. When you get to know me, I was a nice guy. We had Gestapo's. Have you heard that expression? When the gangs, they were sent out people to join another club to find out information to kill the leader. Well, we have this guy named Israel Rishak. Rish I think that's the way he pronounced last name. He joined my club only to find out later on that he was a Gestapo from the bachelors sent to kill me. So he was hanging out with me, knowing all this. And in the end, and 162nd Street, and Pros uh, 162nd, between Prospect and 163rd Street, he goes like this, takes a gun, puts it on the table in my living room. He said, Benji, and I already knew. He said, I can't do it, man. I mean, you befriended me. I mean, you're a cool guy. We became the best of it. He's right now one of the bodyguards for the mayor. <laughs> you, you see what I'm saying? So we became good friends because I never gave him the impression that I was a threat to these guys. I mean, now, when you, 
it sounds like you sort of almost had to have a double life. You know, one for the street, one for your family. Yeah. Now, what about school? Did you take school seriously? Yes, I love school. I love school, especially in the fall. Every time I, when I used to go to, um, the last school I went to was Morris High School. But I love studying. Mm -hmm. I love reading. Guys, anytime, go to my house. From the minute you step into my apartment, all the way to the bathroom, all the way to my room, all in the closet, what's it there? Books, all over the place. And I dock it. And the documentation, uh, science channel, anything, I recorded, put it there. But school, I love school at that time. Now, there was a point in my life when I went to Morris High School, I dropped out at the age, uh, at, the age at the 10th grade. I remember that the teachers were on strike. They were on strike for some time that I lost the incentive. Damn, I want to go to school. So then I said, nah, man, I can So then I, I can't take this anymore. So what I did said, Mom, my, my parents felt terrible. So I left, got a job. Only years later is when I got my GED. I mean, I wish I would just would have gone straight there. But I, I love school. I really, uh, I do. But were there ever, did you ever have any like older person kind of try to take you under their wing and get you through school into college and or anything like that. The, the, uh, well, there were several. Uh huh. Okay, several. The first one was my ex-wife. You know, and I, that's it. Uh, if it wasn't for me, then she was the one who made me into a man. You know, she said, you know, she. I'm telling, she shaped me. She helped me. She. I mean, constantly there. And she said, Benji, don't let these guys do this. Don't be manipulated by this. Do what you got to do. You know, this is where you're heading. At. Take, go to school. Finish it. Do something, you know, through her. Uh -huh. And another guy was Paul Gonzalez. Mm -hmm. Paul Gonzalez came into my community, and there was another guy who was an inspiration to me. Mm -hmm. You know, I came into the club, and he said, I want to talk to Benji. I said, what do you want him for? Better leave him alone, because we got a bullet. I said, ah, please. Where is he? He said, that's him over there. So he took me on his wings. We went to his house on Jessup Avenue. He spoke to me. He said, Benji, you got to get off this trip, man. You know, you can use that power and bring up your, bring up these guys uh -huh. to something positive in the community. So, but, but you, you know, it sounds like you found power in these, building these organizations of a kind that was very heady for a young person. You know, I was, you have to understand the, the circumstances at the time. Even when the politics came into, when the young lords came into the scene, which I never liked, I never liked the young lords. The Black Panthers, they came in, in, in they brought in films, paraphernalia. And I remember, uh, Mark, I never forgot this, I remember when they had the decolonization committee, when there were thousands of people protesting in front of the United Nations on the decolonization of Puerto Rico. I remember the poster with the, with the Puerto Rican flag down here. So they were protesting about Puerto Rico being a colony. So there was this protest, and the cops were here, and we, then we see two guys coming up this way. Suits, tall guys, with a ball. Benjamin Melendez. I said, And they're all together. Don't think the word, man. And the economy, over here. Come with us, please. They took me to the United Nations, went inside in, in uh, the United Nations, all the way down these stairs, and I sat down with one Mari Bras, President of the Puerto Rican Socialist Party, and Roberto Alarcón, the Ambassador of Cuba. I sat there when they were protesting about the decolonization. He turned around and said, one Mari Bras said, this is Benjamin, the new, uh, the, uh, the new guy who's going to bring up the new revolution, uh, revolution movement here in the United States. Roberto Alarcón turns around and says, I read about you in Grama, the Cuban newspaper. He said, and he shook my hand, and I was there. So I didn't expect to be here, right? And I remember after that time, the detectives came to my way, the FBI came to my way. You know, how old were you at this time? Ooh, 21, 22. But how did how did you get to the point of starting the Ghetto Brothers? You know, you, you said you started with the bar. Oh, okay. The originally, the Ghetto Brothers, the concept, the Ghetto Brothers was originally my family, mm -hmm. was my brothers, Robert. Victor. Then we defended a guy named Raymond who was with us since he was little. He became part of the scene. Huey, who today is the Grand Master of the Black Tiger Pro System. And then Charlie, who later I'd be befriended when he lived in 158th, he said, it was a brother thing. 
Never in my wildest dream would I think that it was going to become a big organization. So from the Ghetto Brothers, it became, it just started to propagate. And we just started to spread. And I did that. I went around there talking to young guys like yourselves. Hey, guys, I'm doing this. I'm doing it. Want to join my club, man. This is what we're all about. But what attracted the thing about us at that time was not this or this or this. It was the philosophy of bringing people together. I mean, that... And, and, you, I mean, you feel awe when you just get the president, the vice president of Warlords together, and you look at this sea of people. That's just the leaders, not the members. I said, damn, look at all these guys. And to think, you know, I could just go like a Caesar, but I never did that. Now, when did the, when did the na you start to see the neighborhood start to deteriorate? You said you know you you, you came there in '64 and yeah. said it was it was it was a beautiful place. Yes. And by the '70s, a lot of those. When did you see things start to come? '73, '74. We uh, even my wife turned in when she said uh, the Bronx is burning. When I saw that when the Bronx is burning, I said this is sad, man. Look at y'all guys, man. Hey, whenever you get time, look at a picture of World War II Germany. Berlin, when the when the Allies bombed the whole area, that's how the South Bronx looked at the time. My brother comes from Vietnam. He said, "Yo, Benji, man, you don't know what it is to be in Vietnam." Yeah, I said, "Man, I'm in Berlin. What are you talking about? Look." And I looked at the area and I said, "Man, this is like like after World War II, everything was devastating." I said, "I don't want to live." I, that's what I said in the film. I said, "I don't want to live like this." And I kept saying, "We're doing this." Found out later on. That the landlords were paying arsonists to burn these buildings down. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Even though where I lived, that was so beautiful. When I moved out, come back a year later, it was gone. You know what I mean? But uh, I, I seen the whole thing. I mean, from beauty to, to uh, it looked like a, uh, after war, uh, World War II, and look, go down to the Bronx, different world altogether. Mm -hmm. You guys have any questions? Every night when you went to sleep, and every morning you woke up, like, what were you thinking, like, in, like as as when you was in a gang, like, was you wasn't you afraid, like, what was going to happen to you, like, was you going to get murdered and stuff like that? That is so. What's your name again? Johnny Man. Johnny Man, you're right. Yeah, absolutely. You read my mind. Yes, of course. I wake up. Say, Damn, what's going to happen? I know. I got a thief. I woke out this door. I've always said somebody's aiming a rifle at me. And incidentally. I had a jacket that said Ghetto Brothers, but on the top of me, yeah, it said President. My friend Herc wore that jacket on a hundred and sixty um, prospect between 163rd Street, again, 163rd Street, very Guy from the roof shot Herc thinking it was me. Shot him mm -hmm. in the spine. To this very, that was in the 70s. He stood in a wheelchair. He said, Benji, man, that bullet was for you. Then my brother was walking around St. Anne's with the same jacket, was stabbed three times to the back, one here. And I said, oh, man. So, you're right. I've always said, man, what would happen if I woke out this door and a bullet would just get me? Because you had people that were jealous. That would let a lot of the gangs, members would leave that gang to join the Ghetto Brothers. Because we wanted that gang stuff to, yo, Benji, you leave us alone, man. We're about being outlaws. You know, you keep on doing this, man. One day we're going to take your head. And I've always, I've always feared that. I mean, I also, like, in your neighborhood, you said there was many gangs, right? Yeah. So like, is that is that seeing many people in gangs? That's what inspired you to join it. Like, what inspired you to oh, join? Very good. Gang? Okay, John. If I didn't join, then I was forced. Got it? Oh yeah. Well, you're in the, you're not in the club now. Nah. Well, you better join us. So instead of me joining them, I did my own stuff. I didn't want to be under their rules, their organization. I know if I, if I run if I ran it, it's going to be my way. Mm -hmm. So when I started my own thing, they left me alone. But in those days, if you didn't belong to a gang, either you're in it, good or bad, but you're going to be in it. Yo, you're, you're, where do you live at? I live right here. You're in our club. So that's what it, I, I said, yo, if I didn't join, okay, the only people that left alone were people that were religious, like Pentecostals or Catholic or Jehovah's Witness. I could have gone that route, but I, I didn't want to be. I didn't want to do that. But if I said, nah, I don't want to join, then I would, I would have taken the risk of getting beat up. And also, like, um, like you said, the consequences, like, for everybody, like, if it was that simple, if it was that way for, like, one person, yeah. 
why wouldn't why would they like just nice to the people that was religious like like all the Jewish and people stuff like that like why wouldn't they the same towards everybody why treat one person different and not treat the other person the same because they you remember peer pressure mm -hmm. that's what they saw people they, all they saw is that young guys like that you understand what I'm saying so mm -hmm. when they saw you all this guy's a potential he could be one of us you know we gotta get this guy that's what it was all about mm -hmm. okay I know they would have left me alone if I would have to breathe because nah, we don't want to talk to religion don't put this guy in the gang because he's too, uh, he's going to talk to us about religion. So we don't want that. Let's get this guy over here. See the guy who dressed with the denim with the sneakers, get him. That's how we did. But I didn't want to do that, you know, Don, because I know they would have found me out later on. Ah, this guy's a fake, phony frog. Go ahead. Oh. Yeah. Um, what is one of the most regretful things you've done while you was in the gang? You know, um, what's your name? Andre Hill. Andre. Well, I thought about this, you know, I, one of the, the things that I wish I can take back is when I sent Benji, Black Benji, to get the clubs together, to bring them to the club, it's when he never came back. To this day, that bugs me, man. I said to myself, damn, man, I let him go to bring, to bring these guys here to peace, Benji never came back. It's an only son, and, and the thing that I have to face the mother. You know, that's the thing to this very day. I was in the 70s. To this day, I still think about that. I still look at his pictures. Damn, what did I do? I mean, if I could take that back, I would have done it. Well, that was me. I used to go over there anyway. You know, but I felt that this guy that had the potential, you could do it, Ben. Lost him. Um, if you still had, like, if you still had the same type of people that you were with, like, back in the days. Right. It, um, would it be possible for like if you could like would you try to like still make peace with the gangs now these days like would you would you possibly try oh no doubt about it they invited me who was it Bill Light, a guy named Bill Light invited me to a place in Connecticut I could get it because I got the information home they invited me over to talk to some guys who were Nieta okay, Nieta uh, um, uh, Latin Kings Latin Kings there was always a, these two guys Benji can you talk this so I went over there the lady told me can you can you tell me who's who, man? You can see it right there, the beads. You can see the sun and right there. Now, the interesting thing, you was there. The, on the panel, there was this uh, arranger, mm -hmm. big guy like that. And the back were two big counselors, right? So we were talking. Now, I didn't know anybody here. So when I finished saying what I was saying, then I told the lady, your boys that you want are right there. The other guy wrote me, they're right over here. I told these guys before, right? We became the good friends, man. They got along after that, okay? So the, the ranger gets up, the, uh, the, the trooper gets up. He says, I understand where Benji's coming from because I was an ex ghetto brother. When I go to the back, the two big black guys hug him. Benji, don't you know who we are? I said, oh, man, two ex ghetto brother counselors there. So they, he, he told the young guys, I told you, that I was our president, man. So everywhere we used to call the ghetto brother city because the ghetto brothers were known for what? going out to establish peace with all the gangs. Man, when I, when I went to 138th Street, there was a guy who called himself Yellow Benji, me, and went around there shooting members of other gangs. And I said, oh, this is this has got to stop. I went myself, I didn't want my boys, to 138th Street and Cypress Avenue. When I go there, I'm looking like this, with my colors on, the guy comes across the street. Get her brothers, right? Yeah, Benji, yeah. Grab me, put the gun right here in the street. I said, oh, listen, I'm the real Yellow Benji. That comes from uh, running across the street. No, no, that's the real Yellow Benji. He said, what are you doing here? He said, I come to claim my name. That first of all, I didn't shoot your boy. And if I did, why would I be here with my colors? The only way you're going to find out is at your boy's in the hospital. Was it me? And the guy said, oh, that makes a lot of sense. They let me go. So I was walking down uh, Tremont Avenue with my wife, my ex-wife, and my brother. That comes right in front of me with ghetto brothers with plastic that was painted on. I'm looking at this guy, hey, Benji, look at this guy, I said, excuse me, you ghetto brother? Yeah, what's your name? I'm Yellow Benji. That was him. I said, I'm Yellow Benji, he ran to me. Robert, let's get him. I said, nah, no, he had Benji, nah, nah, let him go. And from there on, I never heard that again. So I took responsibility, you understand? I used to go, shh, I'm scared of him. I did, I, do you have children? Yes, I, oh, I ate. Mm. <laughs> I, 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 I have my own gang. Oh, like, 
Wasn't it like type scary for you? Like, wasn't you like during the game? Like you when you joined it, like when you start when you had your first child. Mm -hmm. Was you interested in leaving a gang? Would you like what would you what were you thinking about like how very good. What happened is that I already left the gang. The Ghetto Brothers made a transition from a gang to a political organization. So we were already getting influenced by the Black Panther Party, by the Puerto Rican Socialist Party, by the Nationalist Party. So we were already getting to that, but my ex wife said to me, I want you to get out of it altogether because they're gonna kill you. There'll be somebody out there looking. And she said, You have a choice. Or your boys. And I said, of course, I won't be with you. And I did that. I went to the club, guys. I quit. No! That we had black barrettes with the red star. No, Benji, you can't do that. Come on. And they were crying. Oh, no, no. So I said, I I'm going to leave. So, man, so the guy, Benji's wife was the one, she was the one who got him out because they, they knew him for that. So they called her every night. We're going to kill you, man. You took away our leader. So I said, that year, I packed up and I moved to Jessup Avenue. To this day, they think they think I'm dead because I met ex terror brothers. They don't recognize me because I was very skinny. You look at the picture; I was a very skinny guy. And then I said, "Do you remember the terror brother guy?" I said, "Yeah, I remember." Him. Whatever happened to the yellow bank? He, the guy, you was there one day. He goes, "They killed him, man. Oh, they killed. Yeah, they killed him in jail, man. They killed my president." I said, "Wow, well, that's that's really sad." So my wife, Wanda says, say something. Wanda goes, you know, mm. So I go places where people think that Yellow Benji is dead. Then one day I had this guy looking, Johnny, was looking at, uh, at my meter. And then he looks at me, chubby guy, an older guy. He says, I see you somewhere. And I kept on saying, I, I didn't say anything. He said, Prospect, Yellow Brothers Benji. Relax, go Benji, man. Oh, give me his card. He said, sorry, he was crying. I thought you died. I'm alive. When African Bambara saw me, what happened? No, when Jet Chan, who wrote the book, said to Africa Bambara, you know, we were in Seattle. You know who was here? So he was with his crew. So he went like this, right, Wanda? So he walks up to me in my head. Living color, my brother. I ain't going nowhere. I said, man, thank you. The, the rumor was that they killed him. Oh, I just didn't want him, anybody to know where I was. I mean, so we were there. Then the other guy was the other guy. The other guy was insane. They introduced me. That's your bitch. I want to, you know. So when I left the scene, everything was the gang situation went down. People started taking off their colors. A lot of people went into businesses and jobs. People joined the service. I had ghetto brothers. That I wanted the ghetto brother to be so military, so military, that I would point to a ghetto brother and say, you're going to join the Marines, you're going to join the Navy, you're going to join the Air Force. But these guys were smart. They did. To this day, they made a career out of that. Their job was to come back. This is how you use an M16, Benji. This is how you do this. You know, and they came back and they didn't tell me like that. I just said, guys, you look great. You know, and they stood with that career and then that's it. Hey, yeah, thanks a lot, Benji. Yeah, you're, you're welcome, sir. You know, but oh, well, I was amazing in those days. But to this day, John, they know nothing about me. The only gang that knows about me is my, my children. <laughs> what, what would you say to kids today who find themselves in gangs and then as they get older and maybe have families of their own, they want to get out, but they feel trapped, like they feel like they're being shot? Well, they have to, the truth, they have to talk to a person like me. They have to talk to people. See, look, what makes the world go round is not love. It's R-I-S-K. Got it? Risk. Because it takes guts. You took, it took guts to you to join and go back there to the giant's right. And it takes guts to do what? To do the opposite. I'm out of here. Yo, we're going to have to initiate you. Then, then take the blows. Take the blows. You know, you've got your family over here, man. But you've got to stand up because you can't run away from fear. It's always going to face up to you. So you, that's why I did. I went up to the guys. I quit. I expected them to beat the hell out of me. But I was ready, right? But that's what life is about. It's about risk. I mean, okay, you can easily pack up and move, but then down the line, they're gonna say, remember me? Yeah. You know what I mean? Face up to it, man. You know? Um, also, like, 
when people dropped out of gangs back in the days, right. wouldn't they consider like suckers or punks no, or something no. like that? No, What they do, like for example, myself, when some guys left the gang, I felt bad. I missed them. I said, listen guys, I wish, I, that was me. I wish you a lot of love. Oh, they were going, Benji, I'm, I'm leaving this uh, ghetto brothers because I want to join the Savage Calls because they want to be more outlaw. You so, I am going to say, oh, RC, man, I'm going to miss you, man. You know what I mean? All right, go ahead, you can go. Uh, it, uh, I'll give you an example. For example, in the in the gangs, you have property, right? Mm -hmm. The girls belong to who? Us. To the guys. Mm -hmm. We didn't do that. In the Ghetto Brothers, the girls were independent. Mm -hmm. I would tell the guys, you get brush with them, I'm going to hurt you. You get stupid with them, I'm going to hurt you because I have sisters. So if you like them, then court them. Be nice to them, okay? Sex things, uh-uh, not here. Orgies, nah, not here. Now, if they did it behind my back, you know, but not when I was there. Second, if one of the ghetto sisters like you and you was from another gang, I permitted that. I can't stop people liking each other, but they would not permit their girls to like one of my guys. Why? No, because we're cyber skulls and you're ghetto. See, that's why, that's why the girls in our club like the GBs. And one time, Johnny, it happened. One guy got brushed with a girl in a party got first with a girl in the party. The girl the following this said that this guy put his hand here and there, and there were girls and brothers that were witnesses. So I said, Tommy, come here. Did you do this to this girl? Uh, yeah, I mean, come on, man. I mean, hey, hey, this is, uh, hey. yo, man, we're GBs. Oh, really? So we had a panel of judges. So then my spokesman was a brown butter guy out there, go to the boxer. I said, what's the rules and regulations, my brother? You're not supposed to be uh, 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 getting friends with the girls. And then you, you try to rape one of the sisters? No, 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 I made a mistake, go ahead, I'm sorry. So then Louis looks at me, four ghetto brothers are here, so I go, when I did that, you know what I'm doing, right, John? You said it. Uh-huh. Giving them a single. They said, when I go like this, Louis standing right here, says, oh, no, well, uh, Benji sent this, here. boom! Knocks the guy's jaw so hard that it came out. I saw it. Mm. Like this, took him to the hospital. Link in the hospital. What was the signal I sent to the girl? They never got stupid with a gun again. You got me covered? It's bad enough that my brother's already whacked. Because I was a very happy person. You give him that, he's going to go out of his mind. Okay, you do some of that, we're going to hang you right here. So from that, they never told me to four or five days later. And I walked up to the guy and said, you that wasn't too nice. Yeah. Okay, we're back in business. Um, now, what was the what were we talking about? Um, I asked him a question about. I think. Yeah. <laughs> I got old timers. <laughs> I, do, hey. I do. I do a lot of thinking. Yeah, you were talking about girls. In, in, oh yeah. And, and yes. We're getting fresh with girls. Yeah. Oh. So you see what I said, gentlemen? Mm -hmm. That's so we treat. That means if your sisters were to join our club, you don't have to worry about it because these guys get not with when I was around. You said, see, Johnny Man? Yeah, well, that's a sister. You mess with her, you're going to mess with me. You got it? Now, Benji, why'd you do that? Because I have sisters. So you got it? So don't mess with my sisters, you don't mess with these girls either. So all the girls were being protected. Now, the other gangs was a difference. You know, they, you heard of the train. Yeah. Every guy goes in, huh? Not over here. Uh-uh. Then now, now that. Now, this guy, they were ghetto brothers and sisters. That he got together and later on got married. Mm -hmm. So you know they, they were together from the time of the club to this day. I mean, yep. but it, it's it, it's amazing. That's the way I ran it. Okay. There's an article in the New York Times. There was a person named Zevi who is, lives at the Chelsea at the penthouse, all the way in there. If in the future you want information, this guy, his mother did an archives of the gang. They had everything up there. So when I saw that article from the New York Times, Johnny Man, I said, oh, look, all of this I just told you, it says it right there. I mean, so they had films, right, Wanda? Documentaries, everything is up there, you know, so everybody goes there. So um, before you leave, give me your address or something, so that way I can make you a copy and for you too, Mark, mm -hmm. of the CD back in the days of what I looked like back in the days, you could see. A lot of these guys. This I, is I the movie Flying Cut Sleeves. Yes, Flying Cut Sleeves. It's called Flying Cut You're going to see what we were like in those. You're going to see me like that. Mm -hmm. When I'm talking to the guys now, when you see that in the film, I wish I was in your home because when the camera's going to each person, I can tell you, that guy's dead, that guy's dead, that guy's alive. A lot of those guys are dead, man. I mean, because what you just said, John, you're going around thinking they're tough. 
go. Yeah. It's about. It is like it is a lot of it's like, like to me it's crazy out here. Too. Yes, being in a gang is crazy. Like, yep. I mean, right. I'm, I'm in a gang, but like you feel me? I I do my thing. I'm like I'm sort of like you in the right. way. Like, I keep everything smooth and there nice. You know, understand? Mm -hmm. And like I was gonna call my cousin the other day, coming through. Young kid got shot. Oh man. By, so I think it was by Morris Park or something. Right, right, right. Got shot. Sixteen year old kid just laying there dead. Yeah. Over what happened? Over five dollars? Over money? Yes. And it was like it was in the. And he was in a game. He was involved in the game. Come on, let's let's pay stuff, guys. Come on, be realistic. Yeah. Over money, come on. Is it really? Would that worth it? Would it, Johnny, is it worth your life? Johnny, said that. Now you said that. I was going to my brother's. Uh, uh, wait, well, where do you live at again? I'm seeing it in my mind. Mm. Uh, the Palm Bay area. Okay, I know you're talking okay. about. Okay, so I'm walking. I'm looking at this guy, young guy, sixties, selling drugs in the corner, and watch him. Well, I kept on looking at him. I said, that's a shame. A young guy like that. Go to my brother's house too, wait an hour to come back. I see cops and a sheep and blood. Mm. And I said to the cop, I just saw this guy. What happened? They drove by, shot him. And I looked and I said, man, I just saw this guy, all right? And those are the things that really, you know, that when you look back, it gets to you. Even a friend of mine, who left the gangs years ago, but he still has that little thing in his heart. His daughter was beat up, constantly beat up by her boyfriend. Mm -hmm. And this was one of my boys from back in the days. So he's already dead. Guy died already of age. So he looked at his daughter, he said, what happened? You know, he keeps on doing that to you. Okay, on a rainy day, takes his hood, takes the 45, goes into the park, tells his friends, you know, oh, yo, man, what's up? Get out, I'm talking to this guy. Then the guy said, who are you? You like to beat up on my daughter? Boom, shot him right here. So I go to his house the following day, I read the newspaper, oh, man, that was me. Well, they kept on beating on my daughter, man, enough is enough, that's it. Two, two years later, the guy died, you see? But that's, this is the way he felt, this is the way I can deal with it. And I said, no way, see? Let the gangs, but he still had that little thing in him. You know what I mean? Hey, daughter, stay away from this guy. You know what I mean? Stay away from this guy because this guy didn't want to hurt you. I can call the cops you, but don't go to the point of you picking up on yourself. And he didn't, he didn't care. He said, hey, listen, they're grabbing out right now. The I don't care, but at least I got it off my chest. Nobody's going to hit my daughter like that again, baby. Mm -hmm. okay. You know what I mean? So, if, you know, I agree with you. That's why you have to be, you know what I mean? Even to this day, I, I agree with you. You could be sitting in a train, and I'm looking at this guy, I was with my ex-wife, and I'm looking at this construction guy. This guy's big, sitting down. He's too young guy. No, you know what I said, man. To my, my ex-wife says, construction guy, can't get up and break his neck. How come he ain't doing this? And then, look at the guy carefully. You don't see it? She what? Keep on looking. Yo, man, right there. As soon as you go like this, you know what, he's, what you saw was a gun. That's why the construction guy was, in it was like this. He was cool. He didn't say nothing. He said, that's why a guy ain't doing it, because if he gets up, the guy was sure. And I look like this, I said, damn, you know what I mean? That's how today is, and you're right. If I look at a guy, if you look at a young guy, yo, man, what are you looking at? So you have to look away. That's the thing with me, like me, I wear glasses, but my glasses broke. Right. So like, I look like I'm giving people mean looks. I do that, I do that. And yeah. people, people just look at me like, like, and when I'm in my school, yeah, seriously, like my first day to my school, yeah. I've been to prison, I've been to jail. Right. My first day to school, People already scared of me. I walk in the classroom, everybody gets up and moved away. I'm like, ah, what's yeah. going on? Right. I'm not going to hurt anybody. I don't come to school to hurt anybody. I come right. to school to do my work. Like you said, I love school just like you. Yeah, I'm you a know. senior. I'm about to graduate. Cool. I like that. Also, like, today in school, like, when I go to school every day now and then, I come in, people show me a lot of love, this and that. There you go. I have a little brother that goes there. I show him much love. I make sure he gets to class every day. There but every time when I go to school, and every day that I miss us today when I'm right. sick or something, I think about my brother, and I think about the innocent kids that's in that school that's that was true. gonna go down because of all the gang members in that school. Right. You got mad gang members in that school. You got right. DDP, Blood, Gang, yes. Yes. Crips, you got Latin Kings, Queens. Mm -hmm. right. You got mad stuff in that school. And then right. you think about it, the, all the other kids that's not down with that, and the kids that's really trying to get the education that's suffering because of all this stupidity right. and stuff that they're right. doing. You understand? There's been so many fights in my school that I don't know that I don't know what's going on. You understand? There right? you go. And it's just, it's just been like. Why, why is it going to happen now? Why mm -hmm. are young kids doing this? Why can't it be a young kid in the day I just go to school 
and do his work and come home like a, like a regular boy. They got kids that go to school, cut class, go outside, smoke, go back That's to school. Right. Throw it out at one. She was with me. We went to Washington High School on University. You know what that's at, right? Yeah, I know they invited about. me to talk on, on the panel. No, cool. So the people in the audience were making fun of everybody up here. Ah, shut up. You know, Auburn, they call me. So I was like, hey, you. And I said, yo, my man, after this is over, I'm going to talk to you because I want to see how tough you really are. You know what did they tell him? Everybody. What? Well, you was there. They all said, yo, my man, you're on your own. He was like, wearing the black girl. Uh, what was he? I think it was a, a, a blow of grip. Red, green, red. Yeah, it's blood. Yeah, so he stood giant, but he was right there. They left him alone. In the end, who did he come up to? Okay, yo, yo, mister, I'm sorry, man. Okay, listen, I'll accept your apology. Because I was just going to talk to him. You would have done that to a guy in my time. Those guys from the old school, they would have killed you. I mean, so everybody was quiet in the school. So I looked at the girls in the front row. Young ladies, if you had a diamond this big, would you throw it away? She said, no, nah, why? Why? Oh, because it's worth a lot of money. You wouldn't throw it away, right? Nah, of course not. You see what you got between your legs? There's your diamond. Got it? Then the leg. And the other one, you saw the other, the other one, like this. You see these guys? Those are gold miners. They're after your diamond. Better show some pride. Man, after that, the school comes, said, I thought you was going to say that. I said, hey, you, if you invite me, you're going to get something. From the day on. I had a lot of friends in that school. You see, Johnny, is when you talk to them. And you don't hide, you know, you're a lion. You talk, but with love. People can tell that you're strong, but you're a kind person. There's something about this guy that I like to, because he doesn't come up, you know. Yeah. See, Africa Mambara can talk to you, but just by his presence, you can tell this guy don't have it. I mean, but he's got a good heart. Mm -hmm. You understand what I'm saying? You told him, ah, that was it. But you can tell that people who do a lot of this, are six feet under the ground. That's why I survived to this day. Because when I met the gangs, it wasn't about this, it was about, come on, brother, listen. I know there's a lot of anger out here. Why don't you and I resolve it? Why don't you tell your club to, and let's go here. I'll buy you some coffee, let's sit down and talk. But it's uh, it's all about diplomacy. It's how you talk to these guys. And John, I, I congratulate you, my brother, because you know, the fact that you're thinking about your little brother, that's cool, man. See, that was not, me. It's not only that. The thing about him is that I really, I really care for my little brother. You know what I'm saying? I hug him, I kiss him before every every time I drop him off in class. Good. You never know. That could be his last. That's, like, That's right. my last time kissing him. Oh, wow. You know what I'm saying? saying that? And then again, like the females in there, I show females much love. I grew up in a household full of females. You, you understand go. that? And I give nothing but females love in my school. Mm -hmm. they, 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 sometimes it's, it's females come to me. Like, oh, Johnny, man, what should I do with my boyfriend? And they'll sit down and literally have a conversation with me. And that's how much respect I got in my school. And it's not because of my, my, my fighting and this and that right, and third right, right, my right. mouth. It's because I show respect and I get it. There you go. You understand that? There you go. To get, to get respect, you have to earn it. That's right. You understand that? It's, it's, not, it's not, oh, yeah, I'm tough. I'm just, now I'm going to beat right. you up. No. For me, when I first went to my school, I went in there quiet. What school hey, you to, Johnny? Stevenson High School. Oh, okay. Academy. Okay. All right. People get scared. And I'm like... What are you scared for? Yeah, you know. And then I found out, like, almost two weeks after I, I was there, you know, oh, we, you came from jail, you live right up the block, um, oh, you're right. involved with gangs, you know, there's mass shootings and stuff, stuff out there. I'm like, yeah, I'm like, listen, I'm here to get my education, just like you. I want to graduate, I want to go, you understand? Mm -hmm. Me and my goal is to become a pediatrician, go out, help, 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 Ooh, help, help everybody go. out there. Kids are sick and stuff like that, because I hate to see stuff like that on TV, you Good. understand that? Good. I, me, I don't know, I want to be the first the first Puerto Rican pediatrician that goes out everywhere and helps everyone. That's, that's just me. Cool. You know what I'm saying? Right, there you go, brother. And, like, that gang stuff, I just hope it just stopped one day. Yeah, man. that's right. You're right. You're stop right. one day. Just like, just like y'all said, y'all stopped everything. Everything calmed down. Everybody got peace again. Right. Come on. Everybody needs to stop killing because every time there's another kill, another mm -hmm. child is born. That's and right. when that child is born, by the time that child hits five, he's already seeing drugs, mm -hmm. guns, right. hookers, all this other type of stuff in the yes, streets. Right. And that's the, what did what did happen? Another person that's gonna God forbid will grow, when he grows up gonna right. pass away too for the same stuff that he that he heard mm -hmm. in the past. So it takes the CJ, it takes a person like you, and Andrew? Andre. Andre it takes people like you that believe in that. See, because I've always believed these seven words: by their fruits you will know them. You know what I mean? People know you by your fruits, by your kind of form. They can tell everywhere I go, people that move in the building. I make friends with people who are evil. I'm alright, Wanda. People who are nice, I make friends with everybody. 
what never happened in my community, and we lived there for 22 years, the person was just murdered. Right, Wanda? Never. I said, man, what happened? And I'm looking at the guys in the block, and you know the deal. They know who did what, you know. I'm looking, and then, so I'm looking in their eyes, I go, oh, boy. So I'm looking, and I, you can almost say, hey, he is right there. Mm -hmm. I mean, so what happened? Nah, man, it was about, you know, he owed five bucks. The guy didn't want to give it up, so they killed him in his apartment. So I told Wanda, we got to get out of here, you know what I mean? But it's like I said, they know me. They know I am. I don't bother nobody. People come to my apartment for what? Sugar, milk, you have whatever I got, you got. It. See, they, hey, no, not him, man. This guy's a cool. They pulled the gun out on me, remember? Young guy goes, this to me. I said, young brother, you either use it or don't do it. In my time, if you took out a gun, it means you're going to pull the trigger. So put it away. Oh, and I walked up to him. So my, this is guy from the scene. Hey, hey. Not to this guy. You look at me. He's doing, no, not this guy. You know. So, no, no, Bobby, I'm sorry. Sir. All right, never, never came back again. Anytime he sees you, hey, how you doing? It's the way I approached him. Oh, you think I'm, no, but the man, you're going to do it to the wrong guy, and they're going to want to kill him. Mm -hmm. You understand what I'm saying, John? So after that, keep your friends. See? And then now, they, he's just smoking the hole, and I, you know, if you're going to smoke, go smoke over there. You understand? It's just, understand? But if I come out stupid, well, what do you come out here? Shoot from across the street. Could they do that? And that's the thing nowadays with young kids. Yes. They're, they're, yo, some young kids' minds are being so corrupted, it's not even a game. Yeah. You know, John? My, one, of my, one of my friends, I grew up with him, yo. His name was Derek. It was on the news and everything. He got shot in Castle Hill. Oh, I had man. just saw him. Yo, he, he just, we what going to a party. Me? He went to a baby shower, I went back to the party. I said, yo, Debbie, come back to the party. He said, yeah, Johnny, I'm going to meet you. I'm going to baby shower real quick. Make sure you know, come out. We come out like 3 in the morning. See mad cops, Channel 7 News, everything. Oh, the van is parked there for like two days. I'm like, wow, what happened? I go over there. I see my boy Derek. I'm like, oh, man, that that's crazy. How's it going to happen? Yes. And he had a good thing going for him. Nice basketball I player. Know. He used to go to school once in a while. He's a, yo, he's a good kid, man. That was my, that was my boy. And everybody in there, everybody... So love and respect for that kid, man. See that? So that reminds me of the situation that happened to me. Same thing. You know, mm -hmm. I just saw my friend. Found that he did it. As soon as I left, they just killed him. It's like you and I. If we did not leave in that spot, it could have happened to us. You know what I mean? And now, so, uh, look at that. Everything we basically, like, half everything we're saying, it got killing it. What is this world coming to nowadays? That's right. That's right. What if there was no guns and knives? What would you do? Would you would you battle it out? You couldn't battle it out. The cops would be in there quickly. What would you do? Now that you got weapons and knives, you think you're tough? Mm -hmm. You're trying to hide all your sore feelings inside? Show them. Right. What's wrong with showing sore feelings? There's nothing There's nothing really wrong with that. All you're doing is being a little bit sensitive. That's it. What is it going to do? Is it going to hurt you? You're going to be scared somebody going to call you a punk? Yeah. What, 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 what are the words? John, see, uh, Andre, you listen to him? See, John, that was Benji. I didn't hide my feelings. They knew. Oh, when the dirty dozen surrounded me, and they came into my club. All my boys already gone. So they come, I turn the light. No, something hits me in my face. I go, oh, I turn. It was a double barrel shotgun. You know, mm -hmm. remember the, uh, what was the name of that, that uh, those three comedians that they were just like Mexicans? The like, three, oh, three amigos. Uh -huh, the three amigos with the guns. Oh, all right. Right? It was just like that. And I said, oh, man, I want this. So when I looked into this guy's eyes, Louis, he saw my eyes got glossy. They think, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I felt bad, man. I had a tear. I said, damn, I think this is my day, man. Because, you know, you're not going to believe this. I was thinking of my wife. Mm -hmm. At that time, she was my girlfriend. Thinking of my girlfriend. I was thinking of my parents. I was thinking of Sesame Street, because I've always liked Sesame Street. You know, you grow over in Cookie Monster. Yeah. Believe it or not, I had those things, because I used to like those shows. I, I said, damn, mind. I will never see that again. I will never see another one like this. So he did what I used to do to the other guys. He tells the guy, shoot him. So I went like this. He closed my eyes and he goes, boom! And he hits me in my chest. And you know what it was? What I used to do, remember the BB guns? Mm -hmm. If you cut it, it looks like the real thing. Am I right? Yeah. But if you put sand inside, that's how I used to scare the gangs. Oh, all right. So they see Benji, or even now. You did it to my boys. I did. You know how I felt when, oh, man. He said, all right. They all left. Then after that, the general, where did you happen? Forget it, guys. As far as I'm concerned, I'm dead. 
you know, they would have had me. You see what I'm saying? So did it teach me a lesson? Boy, but you're right. They saw the sensitive side, Ben. You didn't see no tough guy. Mm -hmm. I said, yo, I'm a man just like you, my brother. Of course, if I'm, if I'm, if I, if I, if I have a tear, it's because I'm scared. You know what I mean? Don't tell me it, it went up. Uh, don't be playing that, uh, uh, um, uh, what's the name of that guy? Uh, nah, hey, you dirty rat. Well, James Cagney, when he was about to go to the electric chair, All right. when the guy said, make the, uh, make it like, like you're going to get scared. But he didn't really want to do that. Mm -hmm. All right? So, be human. Be brave. You know what? You scared? Yeah, I'm scared. You know, you got me. Yeah, okay. But you, it's, you want to live. 54 years old, learn how to talk to people. I always tell my children, you raise the boys, you, there's a certain intonation. If you look at a person a certain way, you know how people, you're right. Yo, man, what's, you, you, and if this ever happened to you, you're sitting in the chair, you're looking over there, yo, what are you looking at? You're not looking at the person, you're looking at the poster behind. Mm -hmm. So it's about, I am so sorry, I wasn't, I wasn't looking at you, you know what I mean? You know, so, so you do this, or sometimes I don't see nothing. But the guy in these days, I was telling my wife, everything is about, mind your business, be quiet. Somebody's looking at you. And you know, you're in a party. Can't you tell when somebody's staring at you? Yeah, mm -hmm. Don't look over there. That's what, oh, so you know, mind your business, but don't act scared. But after that, you know what I do? I, I use my discretion. Listen, Johnny, it's a, listen, I had a nice time. I'm going now. Because I don't want to give this guy any room to give me an excuse to. So I just go home. Right. You understand? Especially when it's a girl involved. Uh -uh. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, Mr. Mark? Um, this is, you know, thank you both for coming yeah, here because I guys. think this really adds something to this whole discussion. I want to ask you one question uh, before we close, and that is, how did the Vietnam War affect the communities that you lived in um, in, in those days? And in, in my time, there was a lot of anti people that were against the war. Okay, now from my point. Just try to understand what comes from me. I'm looking, and who am I thinking? I'm thinking of my brother in Vietnam. Okay? I was for my brother. I was for America. That was Benji. Everybody, I hate, not me. Not me. My brother was out there. And I joined the Marines because I wanted to get out there. They refused it because I had a daughter. They didn't want to take me. I passed the test for Paris Island. And he said, oh, no, I can't do it. You have a, a wife. I didn't know the Marines at that time. You couldn't have a child. But I was thinking of my brother. My brother. You understand us? You know, after that, you know, that's what I like about history. That's what I like. Then after the aftermath after of the war, of the war, look at all the millions of people that these people kill. And we were the bad guys. And look at the millions of, that, they, that they kill. And I look back and I said, yo, man, here we are supporting them, and these guys are bad. Look what they did to all their own people. Three million. Damn. And I thought we were bad. Got it? Yeah. That's what they, 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 I used to remember. I had my own mind. I didn't like people influencing me. To, 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 oh, Benji, this is this. And, 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 and listen, I got a mind. And I have eyes. And I have ears. Let me listen. Let me see. Then in the end, the truth, I don't want to live in a type of government. I want to read my Bible. I don't want nobody to say, no, you can't read your Bible here. This is coming. No, 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 not me. Uh-uh, you're not going to do it to me. That's what I'm saying. Even when I went to Puerto Rico, and I looked at the, the argument in Puerto Rico, the, when the Puerto Rican Socialist Party, one man said on TV, he said, if socialism comes to Puerto Rico, it will be unique. I will not take away the religion in this country because I know what the Puerto Rican people will do to me. You got it? When he said that, I said, wow. He said, I will not be like Cuba. I will not suppress it because I know over here they'll take my neck. So for socialism in Puerto Rico will have to be unique. Can't be like the other nations. I have to keep those churches on and the synagogues. If you do that to me, mm -mm. you understand? So when I'm thinking about this country, no, but but let me explain. When, when something is wrong, you're wrong. If you're wrong, then I'm going to say you're wrong. Okay? But remember, I had my brother in my mind. And there was a lot of brothers out there. Okay? Okay, true. All right? Uh, in, the, in the beginning, even when I read that, man, when Ho Chi Minh wanted the United States, in my opinion, the U.S. should back Ho Chi Minh up and get the French out of there. They didn't have to stay there and continue the fight, in my opinion. So I, I, I said that to my brother. I said, I wish, that because in the beginning, 
Ho Chi Minh. No, he praised the United States. He even said uh, the stars, but he did everything. They said, man, that would have been a great opportunity for the Americans to ally themselves with Vietnam. And look what they did. They took off what the French did. And committing all this crazy thing that happened out there. But I was just thinking of, like you said, I, I want my brother to come back alive. Just like I said, they have mothers and fathers too, the enemy. You know mm -hmm. But, you know, I just have to look at it. I have to balance it. I mean, it just in my opinion, I just don't adhere to communist philosophy. That's just not me. I can't live under that type of government. Me. They, they're going to put me away. Oh, yeah, but the, but the synagogue will. Well, can't read the Torah. You can't, can't do that to me. No, I can't do that. Mm -hmm. Do you have any questions? Um, yeah. well, what do you think about um, the, our current war, Iraq? And it doesn't have the same um, impact on the young people because we don't have a draft, of course. I know, Iran was pushing yeah, so, <laughs> Well, it's interesting. I understand why he's doing that. Right. Because once you have the draft, then people suddenly get interested. Yeah. But yeah. when they don't have to go, um, most people just don't seem to think about it. But it does seem to me that it's mostly like the young people of color who are, you know, who are being recruited into the that's army an interesting, to go over there. Don, that's an interesting question because if you look at the history of the Middle East, you know, you can give a government to a people that they're not used to. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the Muslims think different from us. Mm -hmm. You I can't impose our way of thinking. Places, right. You can't, you can't impose our way of thinking to them. That's their way of life. Listen, we're Muslims. We believe in this. This is our form of government. You can't impose your type of government over it. can't do that. So don't you think it has to do with um, the United States trying to protect there's, to me, there's a lot of factors involved in that. There's a lot of there's a lot of crazy things that happen. That's why I'm, that's why I'm saying when you get into those areas and those politics, there's a lot of crazy things happening along there. What we have to concern ourselves is how do we reach out to our fellow man? You understand what I'm saying? All I remember, the only thing that I remember is when those planes hit those buildings and my wife works right around the corner. Who would ever thought that that would happen here? Mm -hmm. And you look at it, I say, oh, man, you know. And then it would dawn said, it makes you think, because the ones who did it came from Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they didn't come from Iraq. Mm -hmm. You understand? So you go, oh, man. And you go, well, wait. But the ones who did it were 19 guys from Saudi Arabia. It wasn't from Iraq. You understand what I'm saying? You go, why are you attacking these guys when it was really over here? Unless you're buddy buddies with these guys, and you don't want to do it because we know the deal was there. There's a lot of things going on over here. But I, uh, uh, but I have my own opinions about prophecy. You know, I believe in the Bible. I believe in prophecy. And these things are not going to change until the Messiah. Uh, Ch you know, brings come back to the kingdom because the only way we're going to have peace is it has to be to the hand of Almighty God. Man, in and of himself, cannot do it. Because the only way we can do it is, oh, you don't want to do it? All right, it's, then this is the only way we're going to deal with it. See? You kill one person, they're going to want, and the killing is going to continue. Just like the gangs. It's never going to stop, you understand? Mm -hmm. Until somebody says, you know what? Enough is enough. Let's just get out of here. Well, mm -hmm. I have another kind of question to us thinking when you were talking. Why is it, do you think, what's the reason why young people of color particularly, you know, don't have, like, don't want to, um, don't seem to have, like, ambitions, like, for instance, you know, Ed Bradley just died and so on. Like, don't look up to people like that, but look up to only um, people who are pop stars or people who are gangsters. You know, it's, why it's is a, that? I, I don't wonder why. Yeah, I, I, you because know, there are so many other you know, people Don, I, that are famous, but they don't look at those Yes, I often said that to my children. I won't be, you know, sometimes, a lot of times, the media has a lot to do with this. Okay? With it. And then there's certain values that they teach you. No, you know, like for example, I value a person who's involved in the sciences, who's involved in history, who's involved uh, in, in, in professing things that I look up to them because these are the people who teach us things, right? To enhance our knowledge. But when you find, like to me, when I look at sports, to me, I like what Clark said. Remember Clark, the principal, the, yeah. the, the guy with the bat. He said, man, what I really want to want my kids, I want them to look up to teachers. Mm -hmm. 
scientists, uh, uh, and he mentioned a lot of these professions. He said, not sports. Like a lot of um, black kids don't know that, for instance, that the, the head of the Museum of Natural History is at Black Man That's right. Very exciting, mm -hmm. interesting guy. You know, and I've always seen black what about Schomburg? On, um, on, on, yeah, on TV, but you don't see them. Like, you know. His parents were from the Bronx, by the way. Really? His father was a graduate of Morris High School. Who? Uh, the, the the grass. Uh, 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 yeah. The grass. Uh, the grass. Tyson. Oh, Tyson. Near the grass. Near the grass. Right. Yeah. You know. His father, uh, yeah. Cecil DeGrasse Tyson, is a graduate of Morris High School, who is the head of the uh, City Human Rights Commission. We yeah. interviewed him for the project. Oh, wow. See that? You all right? Like, do you know of, like, do they um, talk about people like that in the schools or anything? Well, do you know what we're basically, basically like, in my school, Millennium Arts, we do many things. Like, um, like before, we, had, we used to have a group called um, MPI where we used to have, like, young kids helping out elderly people and stuff like that, mm -hmm. talking about, um, all, all different types of history, like we had one, one, one lady who she was elderly, she was Chinese, tell us everything about her, how she moved to New York, like we're doing like brief history on, on, on every other people, on um, every other person on it, that came, mm -hmm. you understand, like that's, from when I, when I entered the school, that's, that's the only thing that we was basically doing. Mm -hmm. So do you think that influenced you a lot, to have well, your thinking, I don't know. Well, what, what influenced me a lot was that, going through what I've been through. I've been through so much, like, I've been getting locked up since the age of 10. Mm -hmm. I've been just in and out of jail, going crazy. Mm -hmm. Standing around so many drugs, around so many gun shootings. Mm -hmm. At the age of nine years old, I had to start taking Benadryl because of the shootings, I couldn't fall asleep. Mm -hmm. I would break night, up all night, watching TV, until, until the morning time came and I knew it was safe again and I would fall asleep and I couldn't go to sleep because I had to go to school. And what, what neighborhood was that in? Well, that's in Castle Hill. That's where I'm right. living so at right now. So this was in with the Castle Hill houses, or is it Castle Hill Project? Yeah, and mm -hmm. and like it's sometimes maybe once in a while to this day they throw a little shooting now and then, but then again, I still like it phases me a little bit. Mm -hmm. Right. And like the, that's all. That's all that affected me. Is just the ways of my. It's just the ways of me thinking. Like how I think. Every morning I wake up like, thank you, Lord, you bless me again. And let me live. Yeah, but so many people are in the same situation like mm -hmm. you started going to jail real young and stuff. What do you think made you think different? Can you think of anything in particular? Oh, me? The reason why you changed? A lot. A lot of inspiration from the SEALs and staff that's inside. Just me, be, me being basically when I was locked up, I was going to school. I was like one of the main kids like that really loved school and enjoyed it. You know understand? I was passing all my classes inside there. I made the honor roll four times when I was locked up. That's mm -hmm. good. You understand? Mm -hmm. And like teachers they used to really like really help me, like be on my back. Mm -hmm. I used to get frustrated sometimes, flip out, start cursing, whatever, but then again, I used to when I used to relax and calm down. Cause I used to have a short fuse and I used to realize like, and listen to them, Johnny man, they they trying to they make it sense. Mm -hmm. So I guess like a lot of a lot of people inspire me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, you mm -hmm. understand? Like mm -hmm. He, he has inspired me right now by telling me many great things. You know, like, you, you, you've you inspired me. People inspired me by letting me come here and experience the, the college and what goes on here. You understand? A lot of things inspire me. And I, I, like, how can I say this? Like, I'm open to new things. Mm -hmm. I'm willing to try any new thing, no matter what. Well, that's what I, I do think about this and wonder what um, reaches young people because what you're saying, you're open to new things. A mm -hmm. lot of people. But it's like sometimes there, something sometimes people was like that because like the like there was there was raised at that. Yeah. Like very, very stubborn, you know? Like there's some there's some people that like to isolate themselves. I see it in school a lot, like I like sometimes I try to talk to them since I'm popular in school, I try to talk to them like, you know, mm -hmm. calm down, what's going on man, you know, I'm a good guy, I'll introduce myself, Johnny Man Lopez, my full name. No nickname or nothing, I give them my full name, but I know that I'm a nice guy, you know what I'm saying? Then there's other guys that just jerks, mm -hmm. do stupid things. Mm -hmm. Instead, like last week, fighting in school, dude, 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 swung the teacher. You know, Johnny, that just 
you said that. Going back to what like uh, Don said, look what's happening with these games. Uh, what's a, what's a new game that they're selling now? Oh, I know it's Scarface. Yeah. yeah. Oh and yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah killing each other, beating each other over a game. Oh, PlayStation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. PlayStation. Not, not, yes. not, so not got shot. shot. Right. 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 Yeah. Not yeah. outside of Walmart. Yeah. 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 Then I went into the, the buy box. No knowledge is about that. I, I, I took my little boy one but time. But there's grown people doing that. That's the thing when I say like exactly. young exactly. people. And they're, they're, going, they're, I killing, mean, they're killing people for, for the PlayStation. So, Don, I took my, <coughs> my little boy, Judah, mm -hmm. and we sat on a milk crate and brought him around the corner, and I saw a dinosaur boat. Dinosaur boat. And I said, I said, Dicky, watch this. Now, you know, it's a border mall surrounded what? Closed doors, doors jewelry, right, and everything. And look, I'm looking. Nobody's doing this, Johnny. And nobody's looking down. They look, oh, man, go check out the drink. Yo, man, check out the clothes. Nobody. I said, I said did you notice something? He said, puppy, nobody's picking up the book. He said, and we stood there like one hour. I went over. I picked up the book. I said, this is great. I got it to this day. I said, see, did Nobody. Nobody wants to, when it comes to knowledge, nobody wants to read books. And I said, what else do you notice about Fordham Row? There's a bookstore. Right. There is no bookstore. Not. Everything is closed store, uh, uh, appliance, there, but there's no bookstore. Beepers. Yeah. Where are the bookstore? Downtown. Cell phone. Go to the libraries in Harley. You find kids there. Go to the ones downtown. You see what I'm saying? They're, I mean, they're up here. And even yeah, if you do see it, even if you do see a lot of kids in the library, they probably just saw friends join up together yeah, yeah, yeah. to meet up or something yeah. and talk. Or throw like, bottles. Remember that, that, that library we went to? That, that they go in there and they throw bottles at, at the late and say, oh, but what, do you come to the library to learn? And go back to what John, you're right, they go to the hangout. Yo, excuse me, listen, people trying to read or the lady. People trying to read, ah, oh, shut up. So that's why I had to get a guard. In my time, they never had guards. They, they check you out. Mm -hmm. Never had that. And these days, they go back to what you said, you're right. Well, yeah. Like young people don't believe in the future, which I think is bad. It's like I know. Yes. Just do not believe in the future. Yeah. Like, like most of us teenagers nowadays, we just not, we're not thinking about the future. We're thinking about now and how mm -hmm. it is now. Right. Because there's so many things that's going on. Mm -hmm. Like we just like, like most of us in our minds, like, oh, we we at war right now. We don't know. We don't know what's going on. You know what I'm saying? So like, right now, and especially for some kids that got problems at home. Mm -hmm. That's why. That's why most kids some days they join gangs. That's right. Because they think they think, oh, the gang's gonna help them out. They're gonna be that's their family. That's a family. Right. You know the extended family. Yeah. And there you go. then again, that's why some kids wind up going to jail for life, right. doing murder, right. doing fed time for selling crack, heroin, stuff like that, because of this simple thing that there's all this stress, this peer pressure, all this thing that's going on. It's just yeah. driving us teenagers insane. And you know, John, you, you got another good point. We notice when it's, it's when a person's locked up and they start thinking. He said, man, damn, why did you do that, man? And it's when a person got a gun or a knife to his neck that right. he realizes what right. the hell he, what he did. Right. You understand that? Right. And I, I had to figure that out That's myself. Right. That's right. At the age of 15, I had a 45 pointed at my face. The guy said, yo, give me everything you got. I was selling drugs at the time. Right. He said, give me everything you got. Looking at him, me, I was, I was young, I was crazy. I was like, you crazy? I'm not giving you nothing. So then the guy's like, oh, you think I'm playing the game? So he pulls back, and then after we pulled out, I seen that it was serious. I got scared. Uh -huh. So then I started, I started to cry a little bit. Right. I'm not scared to show my tears. I show my tears anytime, any right. place. You understand that? And then the guy grabbed me, then he hit me with the gun. Boom! I fell on the floor, I stood on the floor, I didn't move. I'm not getting shot with no, with no drugs, nothing. Right, right. There you go. So the guy went on pocket, took everything out. All right, I left him. I went upstairs, whole different story. My sister came down, flipping on everything. You understand that? That's, mm -hmm. how, that's how I got my respect in my life, from my sisters. You understand that? My sisters, people respect them. They respect them. They, you know, my, they don't, he respect my sisters, and my sisters respect them. You understand that? They right. just look the same way I am. Right. I understand. You understand that? And my sisters went through the struggle when I was younger. Selling drugs, doing that, being in front of the building, being right. tough. Half of the time, they, my sisters wasn't even acting like girls. Not playing, no playing, no girls for us, no jumping ropes. You know, Johnny, in my time, Andrew, we used to say, yes, sir, yes, ma'am. In the Bronx, when I came up here, you know, it's still, uh, yes, sir, yes, ma'am. Um, excuse me. Uh, you sit in a restaurant, you wait for your turn. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was, and then 
what I did is that I implemented that type to my children to this very day. Even when I tell them to throw away the garbage, I said, I don't want to find out if you're throwing garbage outside, put it inside a garbage receptacle. Mm -hmm. To this very day, I have my children. Since they were little, everybody in the house, in the apartment, has a chore. Yes? Yes. Mops, sweeps, washing dishes, taking care of your clothes, your get up. So they've been doing this since they were tiny to this day. Why am I implementing? They learn responsibility. Then at a certain time, I look at them, did you guys did your homework? Yes, we did. I say, all right. Uh, uh, they have a half an hour to an hour to play their little game, right, Wanda? Mm -hmm. After that, what do I say? Read. All right, time to read. Let's move it. Whatever you want. I got tons of crates of both. Okay. See, John, they already know the routine. Mm -hmm. See, Andrew? They know the routine. After they play their game, they go, Oh, okay. All right, look. All right. You read the book yet? Yeah. Tell me what the book is about. And they articulate it. Although sometimes they say, why don't you write the story? Oh, man, they, they want to compete with each other because they like that. But this is the way it happens since they were little. When you come to my apartment, all my kids, what do they, do they ask for? Would you like, Johnny, would you like something to drink? Mark, Dawn, would you like something to eat? That's them. I go to people's apartment, they don't do that. They don't even offer me coffee. And, and that was in my, my time, and would you like to, shh, thank you very much. These days, they don't even say nothing. So in my house, you come to my house, in my kids, uh, Nana, this is Johnny, this is Andrew. Hi, guys, would you like some soda? Would you like something to eat? And he said, you know, you see what I said? Because this is the way, all right? After that, make your education the highest priority. We're members of the National Geographic. We're members of the Zoological Society. We have members of the, the Aquarium, American Museum of Natural History. I want them to get involved in educational aspects. You understand? Put your minds there. So it's about, well, we go to Barnes & Noble, right? They Barnes & Noble's had a lot they of books. They go to their little corners, and they start reading their books. Everybody knows them. They can, they're my oldest ones go back there. And go, so take your time. We'll rendezvous here at this time. We get our books after the plays. We go to the movies. After the movies, we'll have some dinner. Then we go home. So this is the routine that I mean I've been doing that since the time I was children talking. Children need a lot of attention. Yeah. Don't see, I yes. Mean, really a lot. Yeah. Like even the stuff you're talking about when you're in jail. Right. Like, right. But yet people. Johnny, Johnny said it right there. You, you need attention. There was yeah. there was always this one kid when I was in jail. I never forget that kid, man. His name is William. Skinny boy, yo. I swear, kid weighed ninety pounds. Mm -hmm. Very skinny. He showed me when he bent his elbow. You showed he showed like maybe two or three bones. Right. I'm like, oh man, I felt sorry for the kid. We should get extorted, yo. The kid, um, he was going through so many problems. Parents didn't even call him anymore. Right. Hardly got any visits, anything. And I used to just sit sit down and look at him. And then like, at first, I was just like. I ain't know, like, I was confused at the point, like, you understand, like, what the, am I seeing this for real? Like, dang, it's not even, it's, imagine, imagine, like, I used to think it was hard out, out here. Imagine how it is in there. Yeah. You can't do nothing. You always gotta watch your back. That's right. You can get extorted. And that kid, trust me, he got extorted lovely in there. Oh, that kid, and you know, when it was time for him to go home, he didn't want to go home. The reason why? Because he got used to the system, yeah. he was eating good. When he's outside, his family wasn't taking care of him. He's sleeping, right. he sleeping on the streets. I had a friend that deliberately, every winter, went to jail. So I didn't ask, and my family don't take care of me. I go there, and, you know, every winter he goes to jail. He said, Anna. and one day in front of me, he said, you know, Benji, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start selling uh, smoke, man. And I look at what you going to do? See that guy in the corner right there? The guy thinks he's slick, you know? It's a cop, but he's on the cop. Watch what I'm going to do. Oh, man. Don't tell me what. Goes over there. Uh, you looking for something? Yeah. yeah. Cop, man. Take me. I'm yours. He actually did that. Take me. And he went, hey, see you, baby. I'll see you in the summer. Wow. He does that. He said, you see, because he, I don't want to go. My, my family ain't going to take care of me. So he goes to jail. I said, no, but that's not the way. But. But that's sad. That's how some yes. people's life become. Yeah, mm -hmm. you're right. That's right. I've seen like people who spent most of their life in jail. Um, two documentaries where guys came out and they were like 50, and they went. They did something and went right back. And I quite understand it. They, 
they don't have any skills or any ability to, they've been in jail Don, there's a film most called of their lives. Old Enough to, Old Enough to, Old Enough to Do Time, with Danny Travanti. He hosts the film. I'm in that film, but we're singing. My band, we're doing the, the soundtrack. You know what I mean? So it talks about young people like you seen John? Young people in jail, man. You know what I mean? Listen, you're old enough to do time. Yo, man, I did. Yo, you did it? You're going to have to pay it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But it, it, it's scary even being locked up. Even when you're in the tombs. You know I mean? Definitely. Even when they have me up there and all the guys are, you know, yo, Benji, what you doing here? See, they knew. Mm -hmm. Me being locked up, you know. They never knew me for things like that. You know I mean? Then the next day, my friends got me out. You could imagine when I looked at my father's face. Listen, embarrassment is, is when you're talking to your members of the club. And one day I was talking to the president, the vice president of Wallace of the club. And somebody said, Benji, there's an old man looking at you. I go, oh, man, it was my pops. Now, I remember, John, he didn't know I was in the game. And he went like, he motions to me. And he goes like this. They call him in Spanish, the Russo, which means the Russian. He's a big man. So he went like this. So I went over there. What are you doing here? Um, I was talking politics. We have Puerto Rico Libre. Get over here. And he grabbed me like this, Don. In the club, 160 seconds, he walked me from there to Tiffany in the street, in the summer, by everybody, the president of the set. Oh, man, like that. <laughs> in the street. Then he took me upstairs, sixth floor. 940 Tiffany Street. Take off your clothes. Get in the bathtub. Damn, man. Maybe take a bath. You know the scrub brushes? Did the old days of the old scrub brushes? Mm -hmm. For the clothes? He didn't look at me. You want that, huh? Because the man was just what? I came out like a lobster. Whoa. I said, damn, man. He said, all right. Dry yourself. Put on your pajamas. And I stood like this. And he sat down. What is it that you're in the gang? The bond. You're going to wind up doing what everybody else is doing, but bond, look at all the things you taught me. Isn't it possible that maybe they could turn around and be like me? Oh. And he went, that's a good point, the bond. All the things you taught me, I'm teaching that to them. Okay? I, I, I would never disgrace your name like that, you know what I mean? But look, look at this. I said, ah, yeah, yeah, you're right, yeah, because I projected myself to be something that I'm really not. Then he says, um, you want some coffee? See, and he gave me some, you know, he fell back and kicked on the table. I stood there the whole night, the guys would go, hey, Benji, shut up! But you see my father's own card side? There's the real leader right there. <laughs> so then he kept me in the apartment. I was locked down, man, for after school, I had to go straight back upstairs. So I couldn't go to, hey, Benji, shut up. So then after that, he let me go. Then from there on, he realized that I was trying to form an organization to help the people in the community. Mm -hmm. But that's my father right. in the street. Now, what could I have done? Here's the leader, the president. Man, yo, the hell's wrong with you, old man? What example that I showed my guy, yo, I love my pops. Always have respect. That's right. That's my man right there. That's the real president. My father was a powerful man. And everybody in the community knew my father. If you didn't have any food, Remember the, uh, when you go to the store, can I have this and put it down on the yeah, notebook? Yeah, yeah, the credit. Father, right, my father, trying to get together, what do you want? Said, okay, all right, tell your mother, okay, yeah, listen. And my father can have a notebook for a whole month, Andrew, and your family didn't pay, my father never made a big deal. He said, puppy, but Andrew's father, he owes you, nah, I don't know, well, he gives it to me when he has it. That's the way father was. So he fed the neighborhood. Yeah, he took it. There was one Jewish family left. He told him, you don't need to go to Power Bay, tell me what you want. The, the, the mobsters and everything, I get it for you. Don't want you have to go down, I can get it for you. Then anything, but it could be my father was a man, anything he touched turned to gold. But everybody loved my father. Right? But we don't, uh, the one, we don't have any, we don't have any milk. Ah, go ahead, take it. You know, uh, we don't have any bread. Go ahead, don't worry about it. My father always had a lot of money. But in the end, they wound up paying him anyway. That's how much, you know, after my father passed away, he wanted to get the stores to us. I said, ah, I wouldn't. But Bobby, that's what you like. We don't want to do that. So everybody went their own way after that. Thing. You go mm -hmm. back. The stores are still there, but it's run by other people. Mm -hmm. So I tell people, my father used to work here. Why is he a sir? I was talking about 40-something years ago. 